We had the best time doing the initial breakdown of the body language and behavior in this video, and we decided we'd revisit some of our favorite moments from it. Okay, I know this sounds silly, mm -hmm. um, but it's probably the easiest way to start mm -hmm. um, is just to tell me what happened. And then, so you can start what makes the most sense to you, and we'll just work our way through, and I'll probably, I'm gonna ask you a bunch of questions just to kind of clarify. Sure. So I know you talked to the initial patrol officer. Um, and, and he just got information. He oh, okay. Um, so yeah, if you can just kind of tell me kind of what happened, it sounds like some of this may have started last night or something along those lines. Right. So start where you think it makes the most sense. Okay, so, um, <laughs> I told you, it's yeah. a great question. Well, so we moved into this house three weeks ago because he offered to get me a house here where all my family is when okay. we were in Houston. And um, so he's like, we had decided to separate or whatever. So mm -hmm. we, he's like, well, I'll pay for a house for you and for JJ and whatever because he's all about JJ. He's never about Tylee, but he's all mm -hmm. about JJ. Because mm -hmm. right? we adopted him together. He's okay. his great nephew. We adopted him as a okay. baby. And, and so we adopted him as a baby, and so we've been raising him together. And he travels all the time for business, so he's used to just going back and forth. So he's always gone, like, Monday through Friday. So he came when we first moved in and brought me stuff from Houston, like a U-Haul. And then he hasn't been back. But it's all these threats on my phone all the time, you know, like, whatever, all these things. And then he told me... What kind of threats? Just... You'd have to read them to see, but he's always mad at me, right? Okay. And he doesn't want a divorce, but I don't like him and don't want to deal with him, so that's just how it is. So, yeah. so we married for 14 years, we dealt with him for 14 years, of him being horrible to her. Like, he gets in huge fights with her, he, yeah, a lot of things. But anyway, so he said, I'm coming Wednesday night, all of a sudden. I'm not, I want to see JJ. I told him, I said, I will never keep JJ from you. You can come see him whenever you want to. Come take him to school, whatever. Like, I'm not going to do that. All right. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, okay, look, some simple things here. I would suggest she's minimized rather than maximized. What do I mean like that? Well, she's taking up as minimal room as she can rather than maximizing the room that she takes up, the space that she takes up. We'll see her minimize even more during this. In fact, we'll see her minimize over this in a way that I've never seen before, a baseline change, which is probably the biggest I've ever seen in my life. Abdomen is concave as well, tucked in, again, protective. Blink rate is is high, I would say, even for somebody being um, interviewed in uh, in this way. So blink rate is already, I think, quite high as a, as a baseline. She's forward in her chair, though, so she's she's interested. She, she's paying attention, though that could be something to do with the concave nature of her abdomen as well, you know, uh, curled in here for protection. Very active hands, very active descriptors, uh, lots of symmetry, but lots of asymmetry as well. One last thing on this, that emphasis on 14 years, 14 years. We've been married for 14 years, we've dealt with it for 14 years. Seems that she wants some kind of uh, approval around that, uh, or certainly wants us to pay a lot of attention to this idea of 14 years. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, Mark, I love the fact you start off with baseline because we're going to see fantastic baseline, baseline deviations from this. And I always say the organism does what made the organism successful. This woman is a queen of what she does. And we're going to watch her through here, walk down. She doesn't do chaff and redirect. She does chaff, chaff, chaff and disparage victim. doesn't want a divorce, but I don't like him and don't want to deal with him, so. We're going to watch it. It goes on and on and on. If it were chaff and redirect, she'd be giving you something to go after. She isn't. She's just talking until you let her go the next path, and she disparages the victim. For those of you who are read method folks, guess what? She's telegraphing what she wants to hear from you. So that's a great opportunity for us to talk about read method as we work through here. There's a really smart guy I know who talks about planes and talks about passion planes and grotesque plane and truth plane. Watch the planes in this woman. She starts off locked down. These barriers are beautiful. She's got barrier, has her hands between her knees. And you can tell, I'm going to start by calling her big Lori, little Lori, as we go through this whole thing. It's a very different personality. She's apprehensive until she finds out what to expect. And there's in the 80s, there was a song called Because I'm Blonde. 
I have a feeling this woman has made her lifestyle on that because I'm blonde. And in the in the lyrics to that, the woman would say, BLO, you know what I mean. She would finish no sentences. She would just trail off. And we see that a lot from Lori. She starts off with front of mouth talking and increased blank rates, which we indicate means stress. And she's being solicitous to the person who's talking to her. Then when she realizes what's going on, the sides of her mouth are pulled down, her head, her forehead's up and nodding. That's all intake data intake and that's a frown of understanding is all it is but when she tells her start where it makes most sense watch that blink rate fade boom and then she goes to m m she's delaying confrontation there she leans and eye blocks and gives some nervous laughter and we're going to see that a few times in this thing this is probably one of the weirdest ones we've seen to yet and i think mark you might be right baseline deviation buckle up this is a good one scott what do you got all right, I this this may be my very favorite one because we're looking at a straight up, in my opinion, psychopath, and I want to go through why I think so, why my hypothesis that she has one as we go through this. Uh, Mark, you nailed it. I don't know what else to say about that. Uh, let's see what's important. She laughs in every video except two, except number three and number four. She she laughs in every one of them. We're talking about someone who has just seen her ex husband killed or was there when he was killed. What two or three hours ago? And she's she's so calm. Everything is just fine. It's like she's just come. It sounds like she's at a teacher's meeting. It sounds like one of her kids got in trouble and she's down there talking about that. But the kid didn't get that much trouble. But they said, come here, we need to talk about this. This is what this sounds like. The interrogator does such a fantastic job with this because what a psychopath does is they try to mimic the person they're talking to to get to engage them. We see a lot of romance in here where she tries to mimic the interrogator to get the interrogator to like her. It's fantastic. But the interrogator, I think she knows what's going on because some of these things, as we go through this, I'll point out some of the things where you go, she understands what's happening here because she's asking this or she's doing this. She does some classic, like you were saying, Greg, uh, read technique stuff right down, right down the line almost. And she does a great job at those. You can tell she's done it a hundred times now, but Lori hasn't had a chance to structure her story yet. So she goes through this. She's taking her time. She and she she laughs a little bit too much. And but she's we're going to see her her even though she's tucked in and down. We're going to see her go lower and lower and lower and turtling and turtling. Where finally we're going to see her hands below her knees on this when we get toward the end. It is something else to see this. Her her in this case her illustrators are fluid, but they're fairly low. So she's not showing a lot of confidence with what she's talking about. I know the fellow you're talking about, Greg, for the for the truth playing thing. He's a friend of mine, known for for quite a while, and he does a whole thing on he does a whole thing how I'm sure which he would go through that if he were on here uh, about the differences in those and how we're seeing those changes as we, as we go along. And then she's creating the reason this happened when she's asked the question. She's recreating the reason this happened, not what happened. So let's, t- let's talk about what happened. She doesn't tell what happened. She tells the reason it happened tell me what happened we had decided to separate or whatever it's all these threats on my phone all the time you know like whatever all these things so that this is just bells and whistles of watch out something's up here and keep in mind she's she takes time to create this story because she hasn't had time to structure it yet i think when she and her brother planned this if it was a plan Everything went as they expected, but it's not hap. She doesn't have her story yet ready yet. She has she she hasn't gotten to where this 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 and this. She's and she's really laid back about the whole thing. That's the scary part about this. If in fact she was a psychopath, this will none of this would bother her. Listen to what she's talking about. Listen to the questions she's being asked, and look at how she responds. Look at her body language overall. And this is basic body language stuff we'll be looking at. So uh, Chase, what do you got? You all nailed a lot of the body language here, but I think the interviewer does a great job. She's saying, start where you think it makes the most sense. This is a great strategy in interviews because it allows the other person to pick what they think is relevant and it avoids leading them into a hard starting point. And this lets you know if they're going to go through a rehearsed story or not, just how they respond to this one question. And right away, you're seeing something called GHT, gestural hemispheric tendency. Whether or not we gesture one side positive, one side negative, she uses her right hand like this and gestures off to her right to talk about anything negative. Being horrible to her, like he gets in huge fights with her. And her left side is used for positive topics. You can come see whatever you want to, 
come take him to school, whatever. While she's discussing the negative relationship with one child and the positive and loving relationship with the other, you're going to see this. This type of information can help us in a lot of ways. But most importantly, we're going to use this to see where she gestures in the future about certain issues so we can see how she feels about them. And later in the interview, an interviewer can move toward that spot and start gesturing a certain way uh, to to change or uh, maybe change the way she perceives something as positive or negative, depending on how you want to frame it. And no one who's being threatened will gloss over being threatened. But it's all these threats on my phone all the time, you know, like whatever. Unless they're either lying or trying to protect the person who did it. So she uses uh, the word whatever to describe these threats. And then when she's asked about the threat, she displays this uncommon hesitancy before answering, just lacks the ability to, to answer just a reasonable question. What kind of threats? Just... Uh, you'd have to read them to know but... And at the end of this, you'll see more of this left and right GHT data coming up. When she's saying horrible to her, she's using her right hand again and even pointing in that direction with her thumb. And this is a very valuable data to an interviewer. But you can use this in any conversation that you ever have to identify these critical indicators like this. And I think just this one clip, uh, I alone, and not even including these other guys here, I could do a, probably a, a three hour training on this one clip. Like we could spend a day oh. uh, dissecting this thing. Easily. Yeah. yeah. That's all I got. The eyewitness is you. Okay. I know this sounds silly, mm -hmm. um, but it's probably the easiest way to start mm -hmm. um, is just to tell me what happened. And then so you can start what makes the most sense to you and we'll just work our way through and I'll probably, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions just to kind of clarify. Sure. So I know you talked to the initial patrol officer. Um, and, and he just got information. He oh, okay. Um, so yeah, if you can just kind of tell me kind of what happened. It sounds like some of this may have started last night or something along those lines. Right. So start where you think it makes the most sense. Okay. So, um, <laughs> I told you, it's a crazy question. Well, so we moved into this house three weeks ago because he offered to get me a house here where all my family is when okay. we were in Houston. And um, so he's like, we had decided to separate or whatever. So mm -hmm. we, he's like, well, I'll pay for a house for you and for JJ and whatever because he's all about JJ. He's never about Tylee, but he's all mm -hmm. about JJ. Because mm -hmm. right? we adopted him together. He's okay. his great nephew. We adopted him as a okay. baby. And, and so we adopted him as a baby, and so we've been raising him together. And he travels all the time for business, so he's used to just going back and forth. So he's always gone, like, Monday through Friday. So he came when we first moved in and brought me stuff from Houston, like a U-Haul. And then he hasn't been back. But it's all these threats on my phone all the time, you know, like, whatever, all these things. And then he told me... What kind of threats? Just... You'd have to read them to me, but he's always mad at me, right? Okay. And he doesn't want a divorce, but I don't like him and don't want to deal with him, so that's just how it is. So, yeah. so we married for 14 years, we dealt with him for 14 years, of him being horrible to her. Like, he gets in huge fights with her, he, yeah, a lot of things. But anyway, so he said, I'm coming on Wednesday night, all of a sudden. I'm not, I want to see JJ. I told him, I said, I will never keep JJ from you. You can come see him whenever you want to. Come take him to school, whatever. Like, I'm not going to do that. Do you remember what your your husband or your brother were saying or yelling during all of this? If they were at Just all? Just kind of get off me, out, or whatever, you know, whatever. They were like, like, don't talk to my niece about whatever. Yeah. <laughs> whatever. Like, it was, I don't remember specifics, but they were kind of both. They were kind of in the heat of it. I don't think there was much. Many words, Many words. That I remember. Mm -hmm. So Tylee goes outside. Yeah, she was outside. And, and then what happened? Then he, they got up from that, and my brother had like stepped back, I guess. And um, then Charles was coming with me at the back, yelling at me to give him his phone mm -hmm. still, because I had it in my hand. It was all really quickly. Mm -hmm. And then um, 
when I went around kind of in the circle, then my brother was there. Um, when you said he, when you were going around and he was coming at you with the bat, mm -hmm. how was he holding the bat? Just like that, like backwards. Almost in one arm. Like he was swinging, but like swinging it backwards. He would have done like. Like he would have swung it backwards at me, not frontwards. Okay. Yeah. He had. He was a base, professional baseball player. Okay. <laughs> so it wasn't a good idea for Tyler to get out of that. <laughs> Probably not the. I mean, he played semi-pro. Yeah. When he was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but. Um. All right, Chase. What do you got? Her level of eye contact here is stunning while she's laughing about the situation. And I think she's probably been using this charm to get things her whole life. Here's why that should be scary to you. We know that adult behavior is shaped by what made the person get what they wanted earlier in life and what behaviors they needed to avoid punishment or consequences as a kid. And she's smiling here because she's used this in the past, but she's unaware that it's an inappropriate emotion to display. So what kind of person would spend a long time mastering facial expressions and making people uh, like them and also be completely unaware which emotions are socially appropriate? I'll let you be the judge. All the behavior you're seeing here might seem off. This is because you're seeing the signals of uncertainty, doubt, hesitation and inward focus those four things are the things that we're seeing that might make you feel a little bit off uncertainty doubt hesitation and inwardly focused internal dialogue so to speak uh greg what do you got yeah let's run down just a couple of things and i'm gonna pitch this one off to mark pretty quickly <laughs> but this woman's sitting there let's look at the teddy bear next to her and look at her now and look at how collapsed she's become she's shrinking even more she looks like the puppet next to her her arms are about to touch the floor and somebody i know is going to talk about the grotesque plane i have a feeling as soon as we have this finished up her animation is gone she's not talking and i, I agree with you chase she's like oh what do i say now and where do i go She's adapting to release nervous energy, even reaches up to an uncomfortable position to scratch. Um, there's internal voice, as she describes, and she's now changed planes. And what I mean by changing planes, when people are going up here and remembering things, now she goes down to internal voice and emotion and internal voice and emotion. We, as interrogators, know that she's headed into a place that we can push her a little further, and especially using all this disparaging the victim to get her to, to break, to get her to confess. Her voice tone is different. Her cadence is different. Her blink rate increases, even with that hard eye contact. When she does that, trying to understand the question, she opens her mouth. I see that, you know, I live in a part of the country where we make fun of people who hang with their mouth open when they're paying attention to something very tightly. We call it mouth breathing. I think she's doing a little bit of that as her circuits are heating up pretty hard. Mark, is this grotesque plane or is it just This me? is very definitely gro gro grotesque plane. I also think she's got very long limbs as well. Her fingers are incredibly long as well. So she is long limbed, I, I would say. Uh, but having said that, I rarely see anybody manage to get their hands so low as they're talking that she's actually pulling up on the cushion and and adapting on the cushion now what does it mean to be in the in the grotesque plane well certainly it means that gravity is getting way the better of her she isn't winning that fight against gravity it's bringing her shoulders right in she's concave here she's minimizing i mean it's almost like uh, like some kind of chimp there <laughs> you know so she's she's almost dragging her knuckles on the ground uh one last thing on this um she says you know what were they yelling well just kind of get off me kind of get off me and then we see some asymmetry in the mouth i.e one side of the mouth does something different than the other side of the mouth and we see a, a slight pull up in the mouth now that could be uh disdain or contempt um, but I don't know why it would be disdain and contempt. What is she disdaining or contemptuous of based on the text of it? So in asymmetry of the mouth, we're left with one other opportunity, really, which is, is it, um, is it Jupiter's delight uh, with her? Quite possibly is. Quite possibly she is enjoying the idea of making up a story here. So look, 
never seen this adaption on the uh, on a cushion down this low, and she really has shrunk and heading further, further towards the ground, losing that fight against gravity. So even with somebody who may well be uh, psychopathic in nature, it doesn't mean that they don't have stresses on them. It doesn't mean that if they're put in a corner, they won't shrink and they won't have elements of fear themselves. And I think that's what we're seeing here. Somebody who doesn't feel much fear and has loves to have a great deal of control. But this is one of those moments, even for her, where she's caught in a corner. Scott, what you got on this one? I agree. She's caught in the corner. That's what's happening there. Um, at the beginning, she's talking about how they were yelling, and she, was, she had all these, oh, they were saying this and that. Kind of get off me. Out. By the time she gets finished talking about it, she doesn't remember what they said. I don't remember specifics. She didn't really connect with what they said, as, as she explains to the interrogator, who's still doing a great job during this. And then, again, like you, like everybody's brought up so far, let's look at her posture. Man, she's so low, her hands are below that seat. You don't see that very often. You know, you know, when someone's sitting there, that I think it might be the first time I've seen all the things we've done uh, on this channel. It's the first time we've seen that, so that's really interesting. Again, we're hearing fading facts, more vocal fry. In the heat of it, I don't think there was much many words, many words. That I remember. And way too much laughing when when she shouldn't be laughing. Her emotions are not uh, shouldn't aren't, aren't fitting with the situation that's happening there. What's interesting, I thought, that, and I figured for sure when you guys would, would find this, her ego was hit on here. Did anybody see where that was, where, where something hit her ego? No? Okay. When she talks about him being semi-pro? He was a base, professional baseball player. Okay. <laughs> I mean, he played semi-pro. Yeah. When he was, yeah. <laughs> I think that bothered her. I think that embarrassed her because she grabs her arm, and that's the first big adapter we see on her that's the biggest one we've seen so far and i think when she says oh, he was semi-pro she wanted to be him to be a pro and i think that embarrassed her when she said that now that's going way out there but i think they're so sensitive the psychopaths are so sensitive they're so narcissistic that that's something that didn't make her look as good as she could possibly look and i think it bothered her now keep in mind that when it comes to narcissism and psychopaths a lot of people ask this question all psychopaths are narcissists, but not all narcissists are psychopaths. So be sure you keep that in mind. Then get real close to it, and they'll seem just like them. That's why you can't. That's why I can't diagnose for sure this is a psychopath. But my goodness, she sure looks like one. Sometimes it takes six months to a year to be able to really find out if someone is or not without all the MRI work and with all the brain fMRI work on the head. But um, that's one thing to keep in mind. So that's what I thought. I thought. That that it it sort of hit her ego there when she had to say he was semi pro, and that's why we're seeing that adapter on her hand there, on her forearm there. All right, we good? Mm -hmm. Yep. Excellent. All right, Mark, you had no competition in that whatsoever. You yeah, went. Chase did a lean out good. towards the towards the trophy cabinet of the back. Trying to find a charger. <laughs> How confident he is. The eyewitness is you. Do you remember what your your husband or your brother were saying or yelling during all of this? If they were at just all? Just kind of get off me. I don't know. Or, you know, whatever. They were like, like, don't talk to my niece. Yeah. Whatever. Like, it was, I don't remember specifics, but they were kind of both. They were kind of in the heat of it. I don't think there was much many words, many words. that I remember. So Tyree goes outside. Yeah, she was outside. And, and then what happened? Then he, they got up from that, and my brother had, like, stepped back, I guess, and um, then Charles was coming with me at the back and yelling at me to give him his phone mm -hmm. still because I had it in my hand. It was all really quickly. Mm -hmm. And then um, when I went around kind of in the circle, then my brother was there. Um, When you said he, when you were going around and he was coming at you with the bat, mm -hmm. how was he holding the bat? Just like that, like backwards, almost in one arm. Like he was swinging, but like swinging it backwards. He would have done like. Like he would have swung it backwards at me, not frontwards. Okay. Yeah. He had. He was a base, professional baseball player. Okay. <laughs> so it wasn't a good idea for Tyler to get out of that. <laughs> Probably not the. I mean, he played semi pro. Yeah. When he was, yeah. <laughs> But, uh, 
And then, do you remember if uh, at any time, so you were trying to get away from him, right. and you heard the shot. Prior to the shot, do you remember at any point hearing your husband or your brother saying anything to any either of them? No. Um, so my second very ridiculous question mm -hmm. is, is there anything else that I didn't ask about or anything that we didn't cover that you think is important? Um, I always ask that just because I wasn't there, and so we're right, going through right. something that happened right. a super small amount of time. Yes. Can I so, like yeah, go for it. Just thinking. Mm-hmm. Just that. Um, he was just so angry, like super scary. Did you? Remember how you take your phone away from like a sixteen-year-old? Uh -huh. They freak out. Uh -huh. Like their world disintegrates. Like I've taken my phone away from a sixteen-year-old boy before, and he like he's like wanted to kill himself because yeah. like they cannot function. That's how it was. It was like. Is something on his phone that he does not want me to see that uh -huh. he was like freaking out mm -hmm. like to the point where I thought he would hit me in the back of the head to get the phone okay so you thought it's all right Greg what do you got yeah, we're back to small Lori again. She has the threat identified. Her eyes are locked. And we call that Romancer and True Crime Workshop, but it's simply paying all attention so you make sure you don't lose any opportunity to convince the person. She adapts to a leg bump at specific questions. Her blink rate is through the roof. She's shrinking and turtling more. She goes to internal voice when she's asked one of the best questions an interrogator can ask. Is there anything else you should tell me? That's a beautiful question and one that professionals all use. Precisely where or where she should be, though, is this emotional act, this accessing when she's doing it. So there's nothing wrong with her going to an internal conversation than emotional accessing. Then she goes in this weird little meditation pose, which is just odd as it can be. I'm always a fan of people doing weird stuff because it gives me insight into their personality. But then she goes into what we typically, you know, the old days, you would have called a kinesthetic plane where you're not doing visual or auditory um, accessing. You're just down here in emotion and internal voice. She's behind her face working. She's doing our job for us. You never want to bother that. You want to let that person do it. Then when she asks her questions and she pokes her a little, she goes to front of mouth talking. We said, just thinking, um, and fading facts. She here's another disparage disparage the victim. She goes at him. You take your phone away from like a sixteen year old. And then she lowers her head and looks at her in data intake. We've got her behind her face. I thought this might actually turn into an interrogation instead of it just being a questioning. It's pretty nice. Chase, what do you got? Yeah. So Greg, I'm gonna I'm gonna hammer down hard on this yoga pose for a second. Yeah. So for you listening uh, and all this, our, our subscribers, I want you to watch this again, and I want you to just try it on through my eyes. When you watch this again, here's what I want you to see. This question she asks about, is there anything else I didn't you know, ask you that I should have? It's a common question in all interviews. Somehow, I don't know why, but this question makes the interviewer feel slightly socially awkward. The interviewer is actually couching, qualifying, and explaining her reasoning for asking this question. I always ask that just because I wasn't there, and so we're right, going through right. something that happened. Right. She gets a little bit nervous asking this question. And the moment that Lori sees this insecurity and nervousness, her entire being changes. She develops self-confidence in one second in the presence of insecurity here. And you can see her entire body shift. She's no longer protecting her abdomen. She sits up, takes this confident posture, and looks like a completely different human being. You're seeing someone who becomes confident the moment she's made someone feel or observes a person being socially awkward about asking questions. And I'll just leave you with that to decide what that means. But I want you to see that 
so that you'll recognize it in your life if you ever encounter someone similar to this. You get embarrassed and they start acting more confident or you feel bad and they start acting more confident. That's a big deal. The rest of this ch uh, clip is just covertly emotionally justifying the gunshot uh, wound to a person who feels emotions. And I think she believes she's going to go home. And I think she believes this will all be over soon. And she's going to go home and, and have some dinner. Uh, that's all I got. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, here's what I got. I think this is the biggest change in baseline I've ever seen. The only thing that might be as big is there's one uh, interrogation out there or interview out there where they leave the room and the and the subject stands on their head. I can't remember who it is now, but it, Jody Arias. Okay, Jody Arias. Jody Arias. Uh, which that's a big that's a big change in baseline because all the rest of the interview her head is pointing upwards and then in that part of her interview her head I mean that's a big that's a big change. In this particular case, we see her legs disappear completely and come up off the ground and into the chair. That's really quite significant. I, I like your theory uh, about it about it Chase. I really like like that look whether that theory is accurate or or in, inaccurate um uh, you know is 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 you know we will we, we we may well find out over time however it's clearly a big thing is happening here clearly a big thing is happening here um it's a spiritual pose as well so i think you're right chase in that it gives it's high status it's like and then the head bows and everything goes internal and there's just a lot of space a lot of thinking space i think there's some real thinking going on there as well i think this has given her time to to work out what's what's next because she doesn't really answer the question at all the question is you know is there anything else that we should have asked she doesn't answer that she goes back into enforcing the extreme emotional state that the husband was in so back to the old story doesn't answer the question but what a bold and big uh big move never seen anything so big uh, apart from standing on your head in a interview room uh scott what you got on this one all right i think the interrogator did that on purpose i know what that looks like and we've talked about that before not in this specific situation she's trying to make her this did the same thing to ted bundy trying to make her feel smart trying to make her feel like the interrogator is not very smart i think she did it on purpose i think she's i think the interrogator is that smart i think she's that slick because this is going so smoothly it's going so well everything's just kind of moving right along there's no uh button of heads or anything and she's getting all this information out of her and i I think she 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 did that on purpose. That was that was my take from it. Because as soon as I saw it, I said, "Oh my gosh, that's what she's doing." And you're right, Chase. She got all cocky at that point. She's she thinks she's she's got it all figured out, and that's what you want sometimes. So that might have been the road she was going down. And the question was was excellent. And you're right, Greg. It's 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 the uh, you know is there anything you haven't told me that you feel like you should tell me? I use that when I'm talking to entrepreneurs. When I when I get hired to go talk to entrepreneurs, these guys are getting ready to. Uh, invest in and they said go talk to these people see if they're see what's going on over there as i talk to us i'm here just to talk to you and see what you know see what's going on you want to make it feel like it's the last thing you want to ask them but when you're about three-fourths of the way through that's when you you scoot that one out because that gives you that extra time to work on all that if they say anything uh that that's weird or out of pocket or something you didn't expect you've still got that time to, to talk to them about it um i I, I'll leave it there. But I, I, I think that, that the interrogator knew. What are you going to say, Greg? You know why I use it that way is I give them an out, make them feel like the door is close. And then they feel oh. liberated. And then you go, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Just one more thing. Just one more thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The eyewitness is you. And then do you remember if uh, at any time, so you were trying to get away from him right. and you heard the shot. Prior to the shot, do you remember at any point hearing your husband or your brother saying anything to any either of them? No. Um, so my second very ridiculous question mm -hmm. is, is there anything else that I didn't ask about or anything that we didn't cover that you think is important? Um, I always ask that just because 
so I wasn't there, and so we're right, going through right. something that happened right. a super small amount of time. Yes. Can I so, like this? Yeah, go for it. Mm -hmm. Just thinking. Mm -hmm. was just so angry, like super scary. Did you know how you take your phone away from like a 16 year old? Uh -huh. Freak out, uh -huh. like f their world disintegrates. Like I've taken my phone away from a 16 year old boy before, and uh -huh. he like he's like wanted to kill himself because yeah. like they cannot function. That's how it was. It was like it's something on his phone that he does not want me to see. That uh -huh. he was like freaking out, uh -huh. like. To the point where I thought he would hit me in the back of the head to get the phone. Okay. So you thought... So what do you got?